Hi there, I'm the Mechanic on Rogue. I'm back again with another video about my ongoing aluminum air battery experiments. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the latest design that I've come up with. Some of the cool features of this design is that the battery is completely 3D printed, and in addition to that, it can also very quickly be switched over to an iron air battery. Let's get into it. So here's the model in Tinkercad. Now my goal for this battery was to try to make something that's easier to make, maintain, and scale. The idea that I'm going for here is to use a flooded cell that is sealed with graphite sheet on the side and has a top mounted removable anode. My active materials are nails, aluminum foil, graphite sheet, and salt water. I also use some copper tape, silicone, and electrical connectors in its construction. In terms of making it, Obviously, it needs to be printed first, and then some assembly is required. For anybody interested, I've got links in the description with all the CAD files and supplies that I used. Putting it together is straightforward. The hardest part is getting the graphite sheet to seal with silicone. Let's do that first. The components we are using for this part is four of the screws, the battery body, and the bracket. I will also be using an automotive grade silicone to seal everything. The goal is to have a completely watertight seal between the graphite and the battery body. As you can see, on the side wall of the battery there is an indented grid pattern going through it. This is designed to accept a 50 by 100 mm cutout of 1 mm graphite sheet. The indent is only 0.8 mm deep and the bracket has a 2 mm overhang onto the graphite. So it is intended to squish the graphite into place to help with sealing. Using the silicone, I went along all the edges of both the indent in the battery body as well as the graphite sheet itself. I used my finger to smooth everything out and make sure there were no gaps. With the silicone applied, I put my graphite sheet in place and then installed the bracket over top of it, securing it in place with the screws. As a finishing touch, I wiped away a little of the excess silicone that had squeezed out during installation. Now I'll wait for the silicone to cure. While I wait, I'm going to install the current collector and connector for the cathode. The components used for this is the cathode terminal retainer, one more screw, some copper tape, and one female connector. With the copper tape, I'm going to run it from the top left-hand corner of the battery body and onto the graphite sheet. Next, I'm going to take the retainer and place the connector into the recess located on its underside. Then, very carefully, I'm going to install both on the top left-hand corner of the battery, using the screw to hold them in place like so. The idea is that the connector will contact the copper tape underneath it to provide a good enough connection for current flow. I also ran some along the graphite sheet, just to try to get extra access to all corners of the sheet. This will be the current collector. Let's get back to that battery body. Once the silicone is cured, I did a leak test to make sure there was no issues. I just used some water and let it sit for a couple hours. If there is no moisture on the outside of the battery, I should be good to move forward. Next, onto the anodes. The components used here are the anode bodies, the aluminum anode bracket, one screw, and the anode terminal retainers. The idea is for the active material to be loaded onto the anode bodies and then connected to electrical terminals using copper tape. Not much work is needed to prepare the materials before installation. For the aluminum foil, I took a large sheet, approximately 24 by 12 inches, and folded it to size. For the nails, I shortened them and sanded the rust off the top of the heads to ensure good contact with the copper tape. Now they're ready. For the nails, it's straightforward. Drop them in and copper tape on top.
for the aluminum, there's one extra step. Drop the aluminum in, secure it in place with the bracket, and then copper tape on top. As a side note, I forgot to do that last step until the anode was installed into the battery body. The last thing is to install my connector using the anode terminal retainer. Just like the cathode side, I fit the connector on the underside of the retainer and install it on the left side of the anode. Unlike the cathode side, this one uses an interference fit to stay in place and doesn't require any screws. It seemed to me like the fit on the aluminum anode was a little loose, so I used some masking tape to secure it as well. Now that everything is assembled, I can put the pieces together and see how this battery performs. I should mention during early testing I was overly ambitious and tried to use my jewel thief from my last video to charge a phone with this battery. That was a little too much for it and I ended up breaking something because it doesn't work anymore. So for testing today I'll just be using this one kilo ohm resistor as my load and hopefully by the time my next video comes around I'll be able to have my jewel thief up and running again. I will still be using the battery test box and USB charger seen in that last video. For the aluminum anode voltage is one volt which is good for a single cell using salt water. Amperage output is at 0.7 milliamps, which is okay, I guess. Personally, I was hoping for it to be higher, but I guess I can't have everything. I gave it a 30 minute load test and rechecked my readings. Voltage was still around 0.6 volts and I was still getting 0.5 milliamps, which I was quite happy about. This cell is also rechargeable, although it bubbles like crazy. That's not a surprise, being as this is salt water and it's being charged with 5 volts. Electrolysis is a thing. I'm guessing that the bubbles are a mixture of chlorine and hydrogen, but I couldn't say for sure. Either way, I made sure I had good ventilation when I was doing this. I didn't have a problem with it overheating like last time. I'm guessing this is because it's so much larger than my previous test cell. I charged it for 5 minutes and found that pushed the voltage up to around 2.5 volts, plus I was getting 2.2 milliamps out of it. Now that's more like it. Running the same load test, it came back with 1.3 volts and 1.1 milliamps. And after load testing it further, I found that it still takes a couple hours for the battery to go back to 0.5 milliamps and 0.5 volts. Interesting enough though, it continued at 0.5 milliamps for an additional 12 hours before dropping off. Not that 0.5 milliamps is enough to really do anything with, but that's still cool. Let's see how the iron anode fares. Now this is my first time experimenting with iron air batteries, so I'm interested to see how this performs. Voltage is lower at 0.43 volts and amperage is steady at 0.5 milliamps. The battery does seem to recharge as well, but because the readings were so low, I wasn't able to test it extensively. I'll have to investigate what I can do to optimize this for more power in the future. So there you have it, my first 3D printed battery, but certainly not my last. I've already started to think of improvements since I started working on this design. Like for instance, trying to fit another piece of graphite sheet on the back of the battery body, or trying to configure it for multiple cells so that I can boost the voltage a little bit more. And also, not to mention, I gotta figure out a way to boost the performance of the Iron Air anode. And there's also been some amazing suggestions in my previous video's comments about switching to magnesium or zinc-based battery chemistries. Oh boy, there's a lot to do in so little time. But that's probably a good problem to have. Anyways, that's all I got for now. Thank you for watching. You guys are the best. MGR signing out.